It is the weekend where we are closing out our Creed series for seven weekends now. We've been going through this journey looking at the Nicene Creed, not really preaching the Nicene Creed, preaching scripture and using the framework of the Creed as our kind of uh, framing reference points of various things that we have covered. So we've spoken about how God is the maker of all things and we considered some of the created design that God established in Genesis. We looked at eschatology, we looked at pneumatology, we looked at soteriology and all these ologies that you don't know, salvation and Holy Spirit and the end times. And last weekend, we kicked off part one of a two-part mini-series on eschatology and we jokingly called it a church drink game. Every time I say the word eschatology, we take a swig of the Holy Spirit. And we were drunk in the Holy Spirit last weekend. It's going to be the same this weekend. It's going to be the same this weekend as we talk about again, what will it look like when Jesus returns? If you've missed any of the earlier messages in the Creed series, you can get those on our all-new website, mountainsprings.church. I encourage you to point your browser there. All-new look, entirely refreshed website and all of the content there from the previous six weekends. So you can listen to that. And then incidentally, next weekend, we'll be going into 1 John, as I made reference to. And so you can start getting into that as well as we once again go back with the Apostle John as our historian and theologian of choice as we went through the Gospel of John earlier this year. We'll close it out where he tells us to love one another. But the creedal line that we're going to look at this weekend is simply says this, Jesus' kingdom will have no end. Jesus' kingdom will have no end. So as we try to kind of grapple our way through that concept today, I'm going to try and frame it around four different questions I'm going to try and answer. The first one is, who knows when and how this world will end? Second is, why is God delaying his return when he sees the indifference and or the suffering in the world? Third, how will he return and what will happen when he does so? And fourth and finally, are we in the last days? And if so, what is our role? All in the next 30 minutes. So we'll see how well this goes, but uh, we'll try again to do that. But I truly do pray that we would be a people of the word. We would be a people of the Holy Spirit. We would be a people redeemed in the image of Jesus. I say all that to say this. Let's not be a people fixated on apocalyptic opinion, but God's inerrant word. Amen. And let's see what it is that he wants to tell us today through the word of God. And I, like you, am like, okay, Jesus, speak to us today. Let's pray, though. Father, we ask right now the, the, the finished work of the cross the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, and the ongoing inerrancy and the inspiration of the, of the Scripture would shape and inform our lives more than any one thing else. As we look at society, as we consider culture, as we perceive indifference, even at times in our own lives, Father, we want to be a people who are not passively indifferent or even arrogantly opposed. We want to be a people who are centered on the calling of God in this generation. You have entrusted to us a message. May we be a people of reconciliation, ambassadors for the kingdom of God. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. We'll begin in Matthew 24. Incidentally, we'll end in Matthew 25. And we'll be in a few different references in between to include Ezekiel 38, 39, and some indirect references to Daniel 7, Daniel 9, Revelation 20, and Revelation 21. But with that being said, Matthew 24 begins. See that no one, this is Jesus talking to us, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See, church, that you are not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Who's encouraged? Welcome to church. This is great, isn't it? But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Verse 36. But concerning that day, and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, and not business, nor the Son, but Tim LaHaye only, forgive me, the Father only. But as it were in the days of Noah, so will be in the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, 
marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. The first question is then, who knows when this is going to go down and who knows how this is all going to go down? Well, not Jesus, the Father only. It says that the Son himself does not know how the end of time will go down and when it will be. It's almost like visualize this. You've got Jesus at the right hand of the Father, looking at the Father saying, okay, now... Now, now do I go, now do I go to redeem all things in Revelation 21, 6, declare all things like new again. Now, and the Lord's like, no, no, hold. Hold, not now. Jesus himself doesn't know the exact timing of when the Father says, go. And friends, that should kind of equate into us this, this understanding that there shouldn't be this blind confidence as it relates to eschatology or the study of end things. Rather than blind confidence because of something we read, whether it be a novel or a theological manual of some sort, there shouldn't be this blind confidence in what it is that we have read when Jesus himself doesn't know. And in fact, what we should have is not blind confidence, but this faithful response. That we are faithful. We're faithful when we have reason to be full of fear. We're faithful when we have the opportunity to doubt and have concern. We're faithful because only the Father knows. But the reality is Jesus will return. Jesus will return. And if you want to be on stable, good ground as it relates to the study of end things, just preach that. He is coming back. He is coming back and he will redeem all things and declare the newness of the heavens and the earth. But the thing that grabs my attention most here is this. It is not what is most unclear and yet most often debated. It is that which is most clear and yet most often overlooked. This is my problem. When we read these verses, verse 5, verse 7, verse 9, 10, and 12, and different verses there, for one of them it says, nation will rise against nation. Verse 9 it says, you will be hated by all the nations. Verse 10, you will be falling away. In fact, many will fall away. They will betray one another. They will hate each other. Other And I jokingly said a few minutes ago, welcome to church, are you encouraged yet? But the reality is, and now let me stop and ask you a question. Are you ready to be hated? People in our culture don't even like being disliked. We buy gifts for people we don't like to impress people based upon opinions we don't warrant or want. Welcome to Christmas. The reality is, though, we don't want to be disliked. Friends, Jesus says... Don't debate the uncertainty of the timing. Be focused and positioned around obedience towards that which is clear. That which is clear is that you will be hated. And church, I want to ask you, are you prepared for that? Are you prepared for your colleague to hate you like they already do for the cause of Christ? Are you, are you ready for your neighbor to hate you You're like they also do? No, 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 for the cause of Jesus. Because it's different. Based upon what you have put your faith and trust in through grace, trust in Christ and his finished work on the cross, you will be hated. The people of Israel are hated. And friends, I want to say this. This has caused this apprehension in my soul of going, for me as a leader in a church and for leaders across all the hemispheres in terms of church leadership and life, are we entertaining the masses or are we transforming the saints to be a change agent in society? Because here's the thing, we can entertain ourselves to death. We, we can so be caught up in the realm of entertainment, the song I sing or the song I like or this or this or this, and we can lose sight of this robust discipleship that needs to form inside of us that we're living in such a way to go, yeah, I don't want to be hated, but I'm willing to be for the cause of Christ. John Wimber once said, the founder of the vineyard, he goes, I'm a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you? The reality is whether we are choosing to be a believer and we're choosing to embrace all of that or not, Jesus is coming back and will claim the bride. But in considering all of this, I gotta, I gotta be clear and say it's caused me to go, okay, I want to be a trainer of people to prepare them to be hated, and I want to be trained myself by the work of others and the Spirit of God and the Scripture in my life that I'm also better in that regard. Because Jesus is coming back, and you go, then, why the delay? 
When we see what's going on in the Middle East, we see what's been going on in Ukraine now for a couple of years, we see what's going on in terms of First and Second World Wars and a pending Third World War based upon some sort of scheme and strategy, you might say. Why the, why the delay? Why is it that God seems to be delaying? Well, here's why. In short, it's that God's heart is that none might perish. It says this in 2 Peter 3, 9. Let me read it to you. The Lord is not slow to fulfill the promise as some count his slowness. Guilty. But is patient towards you and I, not wishing that any of us should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So why is it that Jesus hasn't been sent on this rescue mission of humanity yet? So that there might be one more that would come to know the Father. One more. The, the statistics right now in Africa of people coming to faith is stunning. Underground church movements, stunning. It's almost like Jesus saying, I got to go. Can you see what they're doing to our people? And he's like, hold, wait, one more. There's another one, there's another one, there's another one. Friends, we stand in this, this doorway, you might say, metaphorically so, of the greatest evangelistic opportunity that we as a nation have ever experienced, spiritually and statistically speaking. Many years ago, this article came out. It's like a 45-page document called The Great Opportunity. I have a copy if you'd love to read it. And it speaks about this, this emphatic call that we as a church have got to raise up disciples, we've got to plant churches, we've got to establish campuses, we've got to do restorative works. Why? Because we are in the throes of arguably the worst time in society and the greatest opportunity for church and faith and hope in Jesus Christ. And in the same way, we ought not miss the opportunity for our neighbors and colleagues to share Christ with them. In that same way too, the delay of Jesus is so that your kids come to faith. Your grandchildren come to faith. Your spouse comes to faith. You come to faith. John 3.17 says that God didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And then verse 10 of 2 Peter 3. We just looked at verse 9. Now let's upload verse 10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Here's why it matters. The day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and all the works that are done on it will be exposed. So then practically, how is that going to happen? Well, there are various views here in terms of the return of Jesus. It's an understatement, granted, but there are so many views on how Christ will return. One of those perspectives is found in Ezekiel 38, and 39. And I'll share this one view, but it's one of various viewpoints in terms of how he will return. And it involves him returning and descending at the point of where he had previously ascended into heaven, the Mount of Olives. We'll look at a reference here in Zechariah in just a moment that will kind of detail this moment. But Ezekiel 38 is this massively cryptic, apocalyptic reference point that we have about the second coming of Christ. So what's going on is this. It mentions a whole bunch of places and people, Gog and Magog and Tomama and all of these, Persia, which is Iran. Up until 1935, Iran was Persia. All these places, Russia, etc. All these various places converging on and a battle that will be the battle of all battles, the war of all wars. And it converges on this contested piece of dirt there in Israel. And as the armies are converging together, even though we've seen Israel defend themselves up until this point in history, this will be the point in history when they will fight a war they could never win. As all of the armies of the world, so to speak, converge on Israel to wipe them off the map, push them literally into the med, and be done with this problem. And you go, well, how is that hope-filled? Here is how it's hope-filled. Again, depending upon eschatological views in this regard, it speaks of this moment to where when all of the armies converge on Israel and with all of their F-16s and trained fighting men and women and their weaponry, they know they're going to be overrun and at that point of where they're about to be overrun, here's the hope, Christ returns. Christ returns, puts his feet there upon the Mount of Olives, steps into the battlefield and fights on behalf of his people. And he pushes them back and he pushes back the enemies of the world and he declares victory over them. And then commensurate with the victory of what we see in Ezekiel 38 and we'll read off here in a moment in Zechariah, in all of that there is this awakening that sweeps across Israel. 
There's this revival, not a Baptist one on Wednesday and Thursday, but like this widespread revival. And people of all different stripes and colors and streams are coming to say Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Savior and the Lord of all. And friends, that is good news. That is good news that he will return and he will defend his people and he will right every wrong and he will restore the smile to every sad and broken person. That is what he does. He will come, and Zechariah 14 records it this way. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. Again, so much prophetic literature here. Is this preterist, futurist? If you don't know those terms, go back to last weekend. The spoil taken will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped." Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Verse 3, verse 5, and verse 9 are what we're going to look at here. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem. And it speaks about this quake that will cause this division of the Mount of Olives. Then the Lord my God, the latter part of verse 5, will come and all the holy ones with him. And on that day, there shall be no light, cold or frost. And everyone said, amen to the cold and frost. There shall be no, there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time, there shall be light. On that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. By the way, this is all mysterious as it relates to what occurs upon his return. Are there these subsequent things that occur over a certain assigned time period or is it the end has come? Different views here. The Lord will be king over all the earth at that point And that day, on that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Friends, there are two, arguably three, most massively important days in all of history. The day Jesus was born, the day Jesus was reborn, and the day that he shall return. The day he was born, God incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us, for us, to transform us. Jesus came. He suffered all of the shame and the indignity of their going to the cross for our sins. While innocent, procured our freedom as going as the guilty to the cross, even though free of all temptation and sin. While tempted, he lived in such a way to procure our freedom. Then, placed in a grave, three days later, he rose again. This is Easter. Yes, I know that, but he rose again. He was victorious. He ascended to be in the heavens with the Father. He shall return. Those three days is the Christian account. And yes, as much as Jesus came as a little helpless baby, and while we might love to see Jesus as a baby, I'll tell you, we ought to love to see Jesus as a warring king with a tattoo on his thigh, coming back on a white horse to declare victory over all things. And I'll tell you what, I love the cry of the baby in Bethlehem, but I love the scream of the warrior king who's coming to make all things right again. Amen. He shall return. Will he return there in the war of all wars? Will he return in some other way? Don't know, but we do know that he will return. And what will happen upon his return? Well, his return to our death, depending on the timing of his return, we will be dead already or we will be dead at that point and we will be raised into a new life at that point. And the third thing, then judgment will come for all people, for all people. First, for the believer. For the believer, there will be judgment and then this accolade and this award being given and two for the unbeliever there will be judgment and in the place of an award there will be condemnation let's look at these two references second corinthians 5 10 second corinthians 5 10 for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ so that you and i may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done good or bad So you are recompensed for the good things that you have done. You are equally recompensed for the bad things you have done. Where we've been generous, where we've been faithful, where we've been selfish and where we've been unkind. All those things evaluated and then awards conferred. And I'll tell you, in that day, we think, oh my goodness, what award will you get? What award will I get? It won't matter because the greatest award will be in the company and the community of Christ. But in that regard, there's also a second judgment. And the second judgment is for the unbeliever. There is judgment and then there is condemnation, Revelation 20. 
I saw a great white throne. This is, this is John, who will also write to us next weekend. I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. I saw the dead, the great and the small, speaking of maybe influence and political persuasion, etc., the great and the small, certainly in their own minds, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. This is the point in history where the ultimate destination of humanity is declared. And with that, again, I'd say, put your faith and trust in Jesus. Put your faith and trust in Jesus. Don't perceive his patience in your life as the blessing over your sinful choices in life. He is patient that you might not perish. He is not patient to bless you in your pursuit of dark pursuits. Trust him, believe in him. So then the big question then is this, are we living in the last days? Well, the short answer is, and I don't mean to say this in a flippant way, the short answer is yes, these are the last days. John the Apostle, the writer of the Revelation, there we have at the end of the book, is also the writer that speaks these phrases in the second chapter of 1 John, where he says, little children, these are the last days. And then the writer of the Hebrews tells us this as well. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Now verse 2, but in these days, now on the heels of Christ and the inauguration of a new kingdom, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus, whom he has appointed the heir of all things through whom he also created the world. So yes, I believe, and this does speak to some degree of my eschatological framework in terms of how things will go down. I believe that God has inaugurated through his son, through the resurrection and the ascension, the inauguration of the kingdom era. And there will be a return when he comes back to claim all things done and redeem all things for how they were done. But in this inaugurated chapter of time, I believe that we ought to live in the way that the apostles lived. The apostles in the first century, apostles meaning they knew him, they walked with him, they were witnesses to his glory. Apostles lived in such a way to where they had two things going on. I'm going to geek out a little bit here, and then we're going to apply this to the context of church life today. They did two things. They had their eyes on the clouds, believing that Jesus could return any minute. He could return by Wednesday. He could return by next month. He could return by the winter. They lived in such a way to keep their eyes on his return, but they also lived in such a way because of their view that he could come back at any moment, they lived in such a way to where they gave their lives to the proverbial missional plow. They pushed the plow. They turned the dirt. They turned the soil. Why? Because they didn't want their friends and families and colleagues and others to die without Jesus. The reality is we all live forever somewhere. And they wanted their friends, they wanted their colleagues, their family to know Jesus. Well, then what do we do based upon their perspective in terms of the 21st century church? Here's what we do. Unfortunately, in the U.S., more so arguably than any other Western developed world and faith stream, the U.S. has caused this degree of fringe approach to faith. To where on one side of it, you've got those who are so dogmatic and so fixated on his imminent return that they cannot value or pursue any other thing because he is coming back today. And it doesn't drive them towards being missional. It actually drives them to this escapism mentality. That I'm going to hide in my backyard buried shed next to my biblical graphs, next to my water supply and water purification tablets, my backup food supply and my generator whose fumes are not going to intoxicate me. They're going to go out into some other place and I will be okay. So on one side of it, you've got the fringe of church that is so fixated, so debating, so dogmatic about this. But then on the other side of it, you've got incredible apathy. He's not coming back, and if he does, it doesn't matter. You're good, I'm good, we're all good, everyone's going to be God's children, we're all going to go to be in heaven, and everything's great. On this side of it, you've got people who are unwilling to preach the gospel, believing in some degree of universalism, and on the other side of it, you've got extremism, and they're not preaching the gospel because they think they're about to be, quote, raptured at any point, or there's faith is one of kind of escapism. So what do you do? Well, you avoid extremism, and you most definitely don't lean towards universalism. So what do you do? You preach the gospel. You live in such a way to where your eyes are upon the return of Christ. 
but not in a sense of I'm fixated upon it and I'm going to interpret every sign and wonder and earthquake that I ever see. I'm going to live missionally. I'm going to preach the gospel because people come to the Father through the Son. There is no other way. Friends, we're all about this humanitarian work here. We're all about restorative works here. But can I tell you right now, where we have situated the wood shop or the food pantry or the counseling center or whatever it might be in terms of the strategy that we're pursuing, we are not locking it over here because I'll tell you what, we're not about a humanitarian response without the gospel sustaining change. It's one thing to build a bed. It's another thing to build a bed to apprehend and interrupt the cycle of depravity to where they're receptive to this truth presented of Christ and Him crucified. So yes, we don't want to be over here to where we say we're not going to do anything. We're not going to care for the planet. We're not going to care for our neighbor. We're not going to care for anything because it's all going to burn anyway and I'm gone and you suckers are left behind. We're not doing that. In the same way, we're not over here saying we're not going to preach the gospel because everyone's going to be saved anyway because they're not. Universalism is as bad for the church as, as, as it is extremism. We live in this radical middle where we preach the gospel. We have one eye on the return and we have our other, everything within us, pushing into the missional plow of turning over another furrow for the kingdom of God. Why? We're entrusted with this restorative work. We're to shine like lights. We're to hold out the word of truth. We're to live in such a way as to where one eye is on that second coming And one eye is on his first. And we live in this now and the not yet fully. C.S. Lewis, who held to an amillennial view of the end of time, says it this way. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were precisely those who taught most, thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Friends, we have been entrusted with the message of reconciliation as ambassadors for Christ. We give our lives to tell all people, all humanity, about what he has done in his first coming and what he will do in his second coming. I said we'd close out our time in Matthew 25, and I intentionally used the word close to give you a hope that we might be approaching that part of the sermon. Matthew 25, 1 through 13 says it this way. I'm going to read this to you and explain what it means. But this is all about the end of time. Matthew 24, he talks to us about earthquakes and the beginning of birth pains. Matthew 25, he tells us a parable. Jesus would often talk in parabolic ways to illustrate a principle in a story form. The kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them are foolish and five were prudent, but when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, remember, we're in a delaying time right now. They all got drowsy and they began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. So you go instead to the dealers and you buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make their purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was then shut. Not left ajar, not open indefinitely, no door. A door was present on a hinge of the kingdom and it closed. The virgins came back in verse 11 and said, Lord, 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 open for us. Open it up for us. I love that. Like, come on, you, you know us. It's about us. You remember what we did for you? Open it up for us. Maybe not everyone else, but us. We, we deserve this. But he answered, truly I say to you, I don't know you. And then in a very sobering, emphatic exclamation point, be then on alert for you do not know the day nor the hour. What do we see here? We see two sets of people who were both excited at first. Both were excited. Now let's translate that into our context. Both sets of group love to go to group life. Both sets love to sing songs on Sunday. Both groups love to read the word. Both groups love to do missional things, but one of them wasn't prepared for the delay. And while there was excitement, there wasn't preparation. Eschatology is about hope. 
but it's also about preparation. It's about being prepared. Being prepared for that time when He returns. And I want to ask you, church, do you really live in such a way to demonstrate and evidence what it is that you ultimately believe? Because if you do, you will have oil supply with you. Oil in the Scripture oftentimes will translate into spirit. Are you leaning into the work of the Holy Spirit? Or are you trusting in a one-time decision? Yes, trust in the one-time decision. Trust in the certainty of one's salvation. But make sure you're ultimately saved. And living in such a way to where you're placing belief and trust and hope and faith in the one who's laid down his life for you, who was at the beginning of the story in Genesis 22 as the substitute. Jesus is the ram caught in the thicket for every Isaac. Put your faith in the one who is foretold at the beginning of the story and who will return at the end of time in the fullness of all glory. And put your trust in him. Eschatology is about preparation. Eschatology is about hope. And eschatology is about one more word. And it's a word that you might think is a little incongruent with all that I've said so far. It's the word time. But not what time are we in? How do we read the signs of the times? How do we interpret who is the Antichrist? How do we correctly and accurately determine the increase of earthquakes and extrapolate out the exact timing of his return? It's not about that kind of time. It's about what are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your time? Paul says, make the most of it. Make the most of your time. Because the days are evil. Verse 17, Ephesians 5. So then don't be a fool. You might also then say parenthetically, take oil with you for the journey and understand what the will of the Lord is. Friends, I'd ask us all, what are we doing with our time considering the eternity that we have ahead of us? Eternity is a long while. Eternity is forever. We all live forever someplace with someone. Put your faith and your trust and your hope in Jesus, the one who will return and whose kingdom will have no end. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray right now with incredible shalom, peace. Even when we see incredible uncertainty abounding about us, we trust in you. We trust you for the salvation for our family. We trust you for the salvation for ourselves and we recognize that your forgiveness doesn't just wash over us as you declare forgiveness upon us your forgiveness is such to where we can forgive the hardest person in our world us so we forgive us for the things that we have done recognizing that you forgive us that as blood fell upon the hill of Calvary with every drop of blood It resulted in a broken heart that will return not as a broken-hearted teacher, leader, rabbi, and all too often a rejected voice of the kingdom, but you shall return with your heart fully healed, riding on a white horse with a tattoo on your side, declaring victory in all things. And I for one say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Redeem, restore, make all things like new again. Revelation 21.6. It's in your name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us this weekend. It's been great to be with you. I want to invite you back next week as we begin celebrating the season of Advent together. And also, we start a new message series going through 1 John, and you're not going to want to miss it. Mountain Springs, we love you. Have an amazing week.